Good Monday morning. I am MPJ and you are watching Fun Fun Function. Mm, today is one of those days you just wanna be a little bit more relaxed. Uh, so today I'm not gonna do a normal episode, I'm just going to take questions and answers. Jon Beron asks, how do you overcome frustration in our line of work? This is an interesting question. Uh, so I'm assuming, or at least I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting the question as uh, the feeling that you get when you are just you know, hammering your head against, against a problem and it, it just doesn't seem to, to budge. One of the most important things in, in your professional career as any kind of creative engineering like profession is to have a structured approach to problem solving. There are some books about this to get you started. There is um, this book, uh, I was recommended it a while back, uh, How to Solve It. Uh, I've linked it in the episode description. It's not about programming per se, it's about math, but it, it, the the general, th the, the important part is the general thinking process uh, behind problem solving and how you develop a structured approach to it, how you think about it, that is. Uh, and I think that this is something that every individual has to create one for themselves, but I think that most experienced software professionals, uh, well, of course, they ex experience frustration, but uh, it's not a problem for them because they they know what to do when they are faced with a problem that they cannot yet solve. They have, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to think in this way. I'm going to draw these things. I'm going to do these things. You can actually ob observe if a person has this in a uh, software interview because a uh, an experienced professional will during a whiteboard coding session, they won't start coding immediately. They will start by thinking about the problem and asking questions about the problem to make sure that they, first of all, have understood the problem correctly and can formulate the pro pro <laughs> problem back to the, um, to the interviewer. Uh, but also they figure out the general algorithm or approach to the problem before they even start writing any code. And this is an indicator that the, the person has a structured approach to problem solving. They, they know what to do when faced with a problem. And this is, this is very important to build up over the years. And, and you will, as you go along, you will, you will find it once you start learning from your own mistakes when it comes to problem solving and uh, how to think about things. Jose Rios, do you use something like the Pomodoro technique? Yes, I do. Uh, I even <laughs> made an episode where I uh, built a Pomodoro timer. There's a link to that episode in the description. But just to set expectations, I don't finish any Pomodoro timer in that, uh, in, in that episode. But it's fun. Real Tough Guy asks how to deal with vague project requirements. Oh, great question. First of all, it's important to set your expectations of, of project requirements. Project requirements are to some degree going to be vague per definition. Uh, the, if, if they weren't vague, uh, the project requirements would be code. Essentially code is what describes a piece of software and a project specification is only kind of sort of a description of that. Your job as a software developer is to take the kind of uh, fluffy unspecificity of, of your requirements and turn that into the exact construct that is, uh, is code. That said, there are degrees in hell and there are project specifications that are so vague that they really cannot be executed on. And this, the worst kind of software requirement is the ones that do not really under clearly articulate why uh, something is, is supposed to be done. If you don't have the why and there's just, and you just have a lot of what's uh, to like, oh, we're gonna implement this and implement this and implement this, uh, 
you you it's going to be impossible for you to fill in the gaps between the what's because you don't know the why that uh, that was the causator of, of of these what's. So as a software developer, it is extremely extremely important that you make sure that you communicate with whoever your customer or boss or manager or whatever who gave you the specs and make sure that you understand why this this project exists and uh, what it is supposed to achieve and then you can start of taking these things of, of what it is that you're supposed to be doing and start filling in the gaps in order for this to work it's extremely important that you have a very fast feedback loop with uh, your customers so that you can when you have filled in those gaps you, you can send off a slack message and ask your customer if is this what you wanted here you haven't specified and the more vague the plan is the more you're going to be doing that so it's extremely important that you that the feedback loop is fast I did an episode on this called the uh, mission clarity I have linked that in the episode description Tyranno Flex asks, what are indicators of over-engineering in software? Uh, also, how does one avoid to over-engineer in the first place? So, over-engineering is a very uh, large term. Uh, I, if, if we limit this question to talking about uh, the, the two kinds of over-engineering that I think are most common, uh, that is premature optimization and uh, premature generalization. Premature optimization is rather well known. Uh, it's when you start optimizing your code without empirical evidence that optimizing this piece of code will holistically make your software faster. If you just look at this little bit of code that, oh, this is so inefficient, I need to optimize this, this piece of code. But the problem is that this piece of code might only be run once per 10 seconds or something. And then you have this other function that is pretty well optimized, but it's run like many, 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 many times per second. Uh, and even though like this is atrocious, uh, and this is uh, a lot better. This is actually the one that you should be spending time on because that is used a lot more often. And this is the problem with premature generalization. And the way you, uh, you, you solve premature generalization or the way you avoid it is by making sure that you do, uh, you, you do proof profiling, uh, that you profile your application and make really identify empirically which parts are your actual real bottlenecks instead of trying to figure that out by hmm, looking at the code. Premature generalization is generally pretty easy to spot. If somebody makes a uh, change in a pull request that is an, uh, is an optimization, it's very easy to, to spot an optimization because an optimization is almost always more complicated than the straightforward naive version uh, so you can like just simply ask the person okay what was the uh, how, how did you profile this uh, why did you do this uh, performance optimization uh, and uh, then they will explain that oh they I did this profiling and this is why I did it or they oh yeah I didn't really I just felt like optimizing this piece of code a great way to avoid over engineering in general by the way is to have mandatory code review it just tends to catch it. Remember, performance software is born in the profiler, nowhere else. Another kind of um, uh, over-engineering that is very common is uh, premature generalization or premature abstraction. Abstractions is one of the most important tools for a software developer. They are fantastic. Abstractions allows us to take a complicated problem and encapsulate it into like a nice neat little ball that we can reason about completely separately even though there is a lot of complexity inside it. That is the amazing thing about abstraction. Uh, it also allows us to take uh, duplication and create a general version of something so that we can uh, avoid having to repeat ourselves a lot. Abstraction, it's just fantastic. 
But the danger with abstraction is that it's a lot harder to pull off correctly than you intuitively think. For me, I have found that uh, abstracting things, uh, it, it kind of shares this um, uh, trait with doing time estimations. Uh, I, I find that ev every time estimation that I make is always way too optimistic. I, I find that I have to multiply every time estimation that I make with 3.14 in order to get something that is more reasonable. Even if I account for the 3.14, it's very bizarre. And abstractions are the same thing. I just, uh, I feel like I have a good sense of, like, I feel that I, I'm good at seeing that, okay, these three things here, they are duplicated. Yeah, we can probably abstract these into uh, a general form, and I, I, I do that. But then the fourth case arrives, and it doesn't fit my generalization. Uh, and then, yes, everything becomes slow because I generalized prematurely. So nowadays, I find that I, I wait for a lot of duplication before removing it. With code, I find that I, I absolutely must wait for at least three cases of duplication before, uh, before making an, an abstraction over it. And this, this, it's hard for a lot of programmers to see duplication and leave it around. And it's hard for me too. But you need to let duplication grow so that the general case reveals itself properly before you you take a stab at the abstraction. This is very important or you are going to make a mistake. If you're writing unit tests, I found that this figure is even higher. I tend to wait for at least five or six times before, um, uh, before removing duplication. And the reason for this is that tests have this kind of inherent repetitive quality to them, but they are, the tests are intentionally different because they are testing different paths in your code. So the general case is, uh, is often very misleading. It's, it's not at all as, as general as it looks, even though there's a lot of code being repeated, it's, but it just looks general. I hope that made some kind of sense. Which code editor do you use and why? I use Visual Studio Code at the moment because uh, I want an editor that just works from the get-go. I, what I mean by that is that I should be able to, uh, like, if I'm on a friend's computer, I should just be able to install the uh, the editor from the from the interwebs in in a minute and be up and running. I shouldn't be having to configure it in a hojillion kabillion ways. Visual Studio Code is also marvelously well done. I really like that you can just press F5 on a uh, in a JavaScript file and debug it line by line. That is so cool. Edward, should I ask for a raise or quit my job? You should absolutely just you, sh you should switch jobs. Uh, it's uh, it has been shown over and over that uh, more money after a certain level does not do anything for your life's happiness. Uh, unless you are specifically saving money for some kind of, you know, starting your own business or, or buying a house or just something that is part of your life goals. Like, just getting more money is not, it's not gonna make you happier. Jake Lacey, silence or music when working. Uh, I actually, I use, music it has a tendency to be uh, a bit of, bit distracting, but silence is also uh, distracting nowadays because my tinnitus has flared up recently. So right now I'm using a lot of uh, white noise and uh, rain sounds uh, when I work and it's very relaxing and nice. Mike, how do you handle bad superiors who give poor advice and management? All right, so if you have a bad boss, your first, like your first line of defense needs to be to, to lead this boss. It's important, like as a, 
member of an organization that takes ownership, which you, sh you should be doing because that will make you happier and it will make the organization perform better, uh, is to not only lead downwards uh, if you have subordinates, it's also leading uh, upwards uh, to your bosses and also leading to the side and leading your, your, your co-workers to make sure that you all make good decisions. If you have a superior that, that gives you, you bad directions, uh, you need to make sure that you, you manage your manager and uh, make sure that they help them to make better decisions, give them more information about the realities that uh, exist that perhaps they are not aware of, uh, or uh, explain that, oh, this thing uh, that you did, explain in a constructive way that, that made me very frustrated and demotivated, they might not be aware of that. Leading is very, very hard and uh, a lot of the process and people under you are essentially made invisible to you the, the second you, you become a manager. People stop, stop talking to you and you lose the feel for, uh, for the organization. It's, it's kind of, it sucks actually. So you might need to give your uh, manager some slack and instead of asking what like oh my god what bad management they are giving us perhaps you should also ask what management am i giving them that said some managers are simply not receptive just as uh, some subordinates are not receptive to to management uh, and in those cases if the person is is not listening to you and your relationship with them has has become infected and you feel like this is this is not going anywhere and I have done everything in my power to help them become better and they are just not absorbing it, then uh, you should absolutely just look into switching, uh, switching teams or if that is not possible, switching organizations. That is, that is just the reality of it. Our life is very short and uh, it's, it's way too short to suffer bad managers uh, eight hours a day. That will just that will just destroy you. So, yeah, make sure you fix that in your life. How do you find the discipline to complete stuff outside of work? Evan, I've made a video on this. You can find it in the episode description. It's called "Self-Discipline is a Fraud." According to my sound recorder, we are out of time. I hope some of that was valuable to you. If you have any reflections, please post them down below. I'd love to hear them. That's it for today. If you're new, you have just watched an episode of Fun Fun Function. I produce these and release these every Monday morning, 0800 GMT. If you don't want to wait that long, you can check out some of the episodes that I mentioned during the video in the episode description. That is it for today. I am MPJ. Until next Monday morning, stay curious.